We're going to work on a new song tonight called Holy to the Lord. Um, I haven't led it here anyway. Um, it's a pretty easy song to learn. It's a little unusual, though, in that the basses will actually start the song out. We'll sing the first two measures, then the tenors will join in, and then everyone starts singing after that. And the verses, uh, there's three verses, and it just it works that way. But it's pretty simple, uh, pretty easy to, to pick up on. Um, and has a beautiful message. Holy, holy. Invitation song this evening will be the first, second, and last verses of number 380. You want to play rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> well, I don't know. Sorry. Um, hey, good evening. <laughs> I've always thought it would be fun to play rock, paper, scissors to decide who would do a Wednesday night devotional on the spot. And I thought this was my opportunity, um, but maybe, maybe next time, maybe next time. Uh, it is so great to see uh, everyone here tonight. Uh, it is a blessing to uh, study God's word uh, together. And I want us to think about the blessing of studying God's word and the growth that we can experience uh, as we study God's word uh, together and on our own. Um, God's Word uh, is certainly important uh, for our growth, uh, and that's in part what we're going to uh, talk about tonight. I am uh, in, I guess, just a few weeks, uh, going to get to attend my 10-year high school reunion, uh, and I am excited about this. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing some of my friends from high school that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, you know, I went to Eagleville High School, small school, graduated with about 100 uh, other people. And so I know quite a few of them and we're close to quite a few of them while I was in school. But whenever I think back to my time in high school, um, one of the things, like if I were to write a letter to myself, one of the things that I would include um, the simple words, chill out. Um, when I look back on my time in high school, when I look back on 
um, my life, I see that there was a period of time when I um, definitely got stressed out um, and worried about things um, that I was struggling with or maybe some hardships that I was going through that weren't actually as big as they felt in the moment. Um, and I think part of that was being a teenager, but I think the other part of that was being human. Um, and so I find comfort in knowing that that happened in the past and that likely things that maybe I get a little stressed out about now or that I'm going through now will one day not seem like as big of a deal. Certainly, this is true when we think about our home in heaven. You know, there is coming a day when um, our Lord will return and the dead in Christ will rise and those living on earth will be called up to meet him in the sky. I like to think of it as victory day. The day that our salvation is fully realized. The day that our eternity with our Savior begins. And that is a day for us to look forward to. Because it's a day when we know that, hey, all the struggles of life, all the hardships that we've experienced, they're over. I'm reminded of Romans 8 and verse 18, where Paul says, For I considered that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The hardships that we face today do not compare to the glory that is to come. And I find great comfort in that. I find great comfort in knowing that the sickness, the heartache, the, the pain, the suffering, the temptation will be no more. And that I will be with my Savior forever. And I hope you're able to find great comfort in that as well. Because that will be a day of great rejoicing. A day of great rejoicing where we see our Savior face to face. But there's a second element that I've already kind of alluded to in that, you know, as time goes on and as we grow we recognize that some things just aren't as big of a deal as maybe they seem in the moment. And it points out the reality of how important our growth is. And so I want to uh, encourage you today with Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Here in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9, we see Paul begin a prayer, or describe the prayer he plays for the church at Colossae. He says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The beginning of that prayer, Paul prays for their growth. He prays that they will uh, increase in the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they will walk in a manner that is worthy. That's why Bible study is so important. It's because it helps us understand just how it is that God wishes for us to walk, how it is that God wishes for us to live and conduct ourselves on the daily, in our daily conduct. And it's so important that we spend time in God's word so that we can grow, so that we can look back and recognize maybe what we're 
worried about, maybe what we're stressing about, maybe the struggles in our life weren't actually as big of a deal as they seemed because of the redemption that we have experienced in Christ and the growth we have uh, gained as his disciple. Verse 11, he says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And that's what I want us to leave tonight thinking about. Um, relying on God for strength so that we can endure with patience and great joy anticipating the day of victory, the day that our Savior returns. If you're struggling tonight with sin, temptation, discouragement, maybe life's just been tough lately. We want to encourage you and strengthen you in any way that we can. We would love to pray with you, and support you, so that together we can experience victory in our Lord and Savior. If you've not yet put Christ on in baptism, there's no greater day than today to do just that. Because that is the moment when we repent of our sins, confess Jesus as Lord, and are buried in the waters of baptism. It's in that moment that we gain our salvation. It's in that moment that our sins are washed away, that we are forgiven, and that our relationship with God is restored. If you have not yet made that decision, we want to encourage you to do that tonight. But whatever your need may be, we want to encourage you to come as together we stand and sing. Just as Lord, we're thankful for letting us be here tonight to worship you. We thank you for the lesson that Chris presented to us tonight, and we just ask to help us take it in our daily walk. We ask to be with the teachers tonight as they've prepared their lesson, and be with us also to go in class with open ears and open hearts. We want to thank you for the blessings that you pour on us every single day, and <clears throat> uh, 
most of all, we thank you for your sending your son to die for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. If you can hear over, uh, we are in First Samuel, First Samuel, and Chapter Seventeen. And if you don't have the first four pages of that lesson sheet, raise your hand. And they're also on the website, uh, if you've got an iPad or something. Uh, do we need some more? We're good? Okay. Uh, we had gotten down through the first three verses last week, and let me, let me find my little clicker here. Uh, the setting is down in the Valley of Elah, and the Valley of Elah, Elah means terebinth, so it's the Valley of the Terebinth Trees, and um, it's about 12 miles west of 
Bethlehem uh, on the way to uh, Gaza and the Philistine territory, uh, what we today call the Gaza Strip. Uh, if you continued on past the going west, you would run into Gaza and Ekron uh, and Gath. You, you would run into those Philistine cities. Um, the Israelites are at the northeastern corner of the Valley of Elah. Philistines are at the southeastern corner of the Valley of Elah. There's Gath and Ekron. We're not talking about a long distance here. Uh, you can see the scale here and uh, probably about seven miles from Gath. We talked last week a lot about Azika, uh, it, just because it fits into uh, Israelite history. And then I showed you this picture of the Valley of Elah from about five years ago when we were uh, in Israel. So the, the armies are there, they're camped out, and so we pick up in verse four tonight, and a champion. And it's an interesting word there uh, for a champion. Uh, ish, I'll just, at the end of that first line, ish means man. So it's a man, and ha is the, uh, ish ha benayim. And when you see that M at the end, it means a, a plural. So it's, uh, they use the word champion, and I'm, I'm, I'm spending a little bit of time with this because at the very near the end of the chapter, they're gonna use champion again. Well, they're gonna use it one more time uh, in verse 23, I believe it is. But at the end of the chapter, they're going to use champion again. But it's going to be a totally different word. And I just want you to be aware of that, uh, how they change it. But, uh, and a champion uh, went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And if you, if you read cubits and you don't know what it means, it's about 18 inches. And a span is about nine inches. And from the tip of my little finger to the tip of my thumb is almost exactly nine inches. That's a span. If you take six cubits in the span, it would be nine feet and nine inches. That's a tall person. And some people say, well, they couldn't be that tall. Well, yes, they could. We, we have a guy, uh, had a guy years ago, I think he was eight feet, 11 inches. And, and there've been other people in history over nine feet. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. So don't, don't just, nine and nine. no, it couldn't be. Yeah, it could be. And when you take his armor, it fits for that size of a person. So. Uh, don't, don't throw it out. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and those were called greaves and it was just uh, some type of armor that covered the, the legs. I think of a shortstop in baseball, uh, how they cover their shins and all. Well, they covered the, the, the thigh portion also with these greaves and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him. Now this shield bearer had a shield that was almost the size of a human. I can't imagine the, the guy that had to carry a shield for, for Goliath. Uh, he, he had to be a strong little dude to carry that thing. But so, so here's, here's, just imagine this, this giant and he's, he's covered in armor and these big weapons. That's a formidable foe. I don't care who you are. That would be a formidable foe. And, uh, well, what I want to tell you about uh, this, 
The shekel was 0.403 ounces, I think it was. Yeah, 0.403 ounces. So his armor weighed 106 pounds, and his uh, spearhead would weigh 15 to 16 pounds. Uh, if you just think about that, holding a spear, that one end of it had 16 pounds on it at the end, and you're trying to balance this and throw it, that would be a, it would take a very strong man to, to be able to do that. It would just, it would be hard to maneuver something like that. It just, uh, and I don't know that we can fully comprehend uh, what Goliath looked like. I know I've seen a bunch of drawings uh, of him, and I, I saw one today, uh, but uh, he, he must have been really a formidable character. It seemed like there was something else here. Uh, no, I guess that was it. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? He didn't call them soldiers. You're Saul's slaves, which is kind of an insult, really, uh, to, to say you're just servants of Saul. Um, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I know what I forgot to talk about. What this word for champion men. I, I talked about spelling it out and pronouncing it. It was a man of the inner spaces. And the first time I read that, I thought, what? What does that mean? Man of the inner spaces. <clears throat> it was a man or a, a man of the in-between. It was a representative of an army who would go out and get in between the battle lines, and the other army would send a person out to fight him. That would settle the war. In other words, rather than risk your whole armies and, and all, the, they would just let one man be the representative fighter and the other side have a representative fighter. And that was what the, the man of the inner spaces was. Goliath was the man of the inner space. He's the man who went out in the middle and said, send out a man and I'll fight him. Whoever wins, wins the whole thing. If we win, then you're going to be our servants. We well, already the servants saw you're going to be our servants. But if you beat me, I just think he's pretty bold to make that statement. He had forgotten about when they stole the Ark of the Covenant and what God did to him. He's perhaps forgotten that story. And so he says, if, if by some slim chance, you aren't going to do it, but I'm just going to give you this. If you beat me, then we'll be your servants. So that's the man of the inner spaces. And he, here it's translated the champion. And almost all major translations call him the champion. I'm not sure that's a good word, a good translation, but people smarter than me decided on that. And uh, so that's what we have now. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. When, when Goliath defies the army of Israel, he's defying God Almighty. Okay, when he, he defies the army of Israel, he's defying God Almighty. He is blaspheming. Give me a man that we may fight together. There's the you send me a guy to fight me, and we'll, we'll settle this, this war right here and now. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I don't know what it would be like to be lined up in battle and know you're going to lose. 
know that all the odds are stacked against you. But since Saul was not relying on the Lord, it, it, it traveled downhill. The, the, it went down the chain of command. They said, we can't beat these guys. We are fr afraid. We're scared. This guy is, well, he represents all the Philistines, and, and so they're, they're, they're just a formidable foe. We can't win. So they're terrified of Goliath. Now, if the king's afraid, if the commander-in-chief's afraid, all the soldiers are going to be afraid. That's just, that's just the way it is. Now, David, <clears throat> David, I put David because when I was studying Hebrew, my professor had, an, he had one son, he was adopted. Uh, nobody in here studied under Dr. Cloud, did they? Ah, I'm glad, Eric. I, Eric doesn't look like he's glad he studied under Dr. Cloud. <laughs> but Bill Cooper was. I love Dr. Cloud. Went to Israel with him a couple of times. Uh, the, I don't know why I tell all this, but Dr. Cloud, he just tell the same old story all, over and over again. He'd tell the same story. But when he would talk about his son, he had an adopted son. His name was David. And he would just say, and David would do this, and David would do that. And uh, so uh, I, it's hard for me to look at David and not say David because uh, he kind of drilled it into my head. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. A lot of that we already knew. You remember when Saul, uh, Samuel went down and anointed David, we learned uh, all about the family, that there were eight sons. Well, Chronicles only has seven, that there were eight sons, and David was the youngest, and we learned the names of the three oldest. Other than that, we didn't know the names of the sons, but Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah uh, were the three oldest sons. And uh, here we learned that Jesse was old, advanced in years. We don't know how old, but it just says he was old in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. It's kind of an interesting word. Uh, uh, I, I talk a lot about halak, uh, the word for walk. And uh, Jesse, the sons of Jesse had gone, they halak, to follow, to walk after. That's what halak akar means, is to walk after or walk behind Saul in back to the battle. The names of his three sons who went, who halak to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn next to him, Abinadab, and the third Shema, which we, we already knew. I'm kind of going fast. Anybody want to ask a question or comment? Okay, we'll, we'll speed on. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed walked behind or walked after Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Remember, David was playing the harp or the lyre to calm Saul's nerves. So this kind of says, this is going on. Uh, David goes to there and calms Saul down, and then he goes back home, tends the sheep, and when they need him to calm Saul down, uh, he goes back up to uh, where Saul is in Gibeah. Uh, otherwise, he's down in uh, Bethlehem tending sheep, and that's where we're going to find him uh, in this story. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days morning and that's an interesting thing for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days, 40 nights has several occurrences in scripture that we know about. 
But here, here's a pagan, a heathen, and he is using 40 days and 40 nights where he goes out and he taunts, he blasphemes and challenges the army of Israel. 40 days, I mean, can you imagine hearing that for 40 days and for, I probably shouldn't tell, say this one. If you've ever gone to a country that has, uh, that is Islamic and you have to hear the call to prayer, it's, it's I don't know, if, to me it's like fingers across a blackboard uh, as they yell out and they uh, sound music and they have their call to prayer. As, as a Christian, it just kind of bothers me. It's not that I hate Muslims, it just kind of bothers me that uh, they're getting away with that uh, and, and they're doing that. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, here's this terrified army of Israel and they're having to hear this. I would say that would just just make them scareder and scareder uh, to, to hear that. Then Jesse said to his son, David, wait a second, David, why are you in Bethlehem right now? Well, if Saul's in battle, um, evidently the evil spirit's not troubling him right now, and so he didn't need any heart players. He needs some fighting men. So uh, he said, David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. There's a lot of things in, in this, these verses. Um, one is, uh, unlike armies of today, uh, families had to provide food for their young men in the army. So that's one of the reasons that David was being sent to take food uh, for his brothers. And so also the captain of their thousand uh, Take him some food too, you know, maybe he'll be nice to you. Uh, you know, your commander, you know, that's a nice uh, to give him something to eat also. And this word for thousand, um, I hadn't talked about this before. We've seen this word for a thousand uh, several times. Many scholars believe that it's not thousand, it's for a, a, a military unit. So it could be any number, much less than a thousand. Does anybody have a translation that, that has something different from a captain of their thousand? I'd be kind of interested to know if. Also, no, have I? No, I hadn't passed the map yet. I have another handout to pick up. So. Uh, Anything other than a thousand? Okay. Okay. This has been probably only a, a, one of the much newer translations would have something different. This is something that, that has been learned over the years that this word probably meant other things than just a thousand. So, um, but it, it may not mean that, it may just be uh, the captain of their unit or the commander of their unit. And, um, but it seems like really, Jesse really wants to know how his sons are doing. And, and it, he says, uh, how your brothers fare, and, and there's some verbs that are like asking about their peace, their shalom um, for, for that, about how they're faring and bring back news of them. Can, you can imagine that uh, here's a dad with three sons in the military. He wants to know how they're doing. Uh, today, 
I understand now that uh, even soldiers have their own cell phone and they can make calls. Um, it's just totally different uh, military. I, now I know they can't do that in every case, but uh, I was reading something the other day where in basic training they're allowing them to, to call home. Used to, no. You might write a letter, but <laughs> yeah, the sergeant said, write a letter and send it home, but you didn't call. And, uh, but but you, you can imagine uh, Jesse being old, wanting to know how his boys are. Uh, I think all of us as parents can understand that. And then uh, again, Scripture says, and, and Saul and, and all, all the men of Israel were in the Valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. They weren't fighting, but they were poised for battle, uh, which might be a, a better way of putting that. And I guess now it's time for the next handout. Y'all are good volunteers. Thank you. I appreciate it. I still haven't finished all the sheets for this chapter. There's 58 verses. I got through 51 today. Uh, it's... Uh, I watched a class online today uh, from a university or a college in Jerusalem, but the guy that teach it, was teaching the class was out of California, but it's on the Psalms of, uh, that David and Solomon wrote, and he just picked several of the Psalms, but uh, it was, uh, I don't know why I'm telling you that either, but uh, <laughs> it was very educational. Yes? That's one of the puzzling things about Scripture. So, so the, the, the comment, just so the, uh, on the video uh, we, we can understand what I'm talking about, the verse says, And all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. I, I think just common sense says, now wait a second. All the men of Israel weren't there. And so uh, I guess you would classify that as hyperbole. Uh, as many of the fighting men as they could gather were, were there uh, uh, in, in the military there. But uh, Scripture all, often uses terms like that. Uh, all the, uh, many times in the Old Testament it'll talk about um, gathering the children of Israel together to give them a message from God. And it says, all of them. Well, they weren't all there. Sometimes it just means all the elders of Israel or the leaders. So, uh, but, but good comment, good, good, uh, good point about the way um, Scripture is worded sometimes. It, it can be misleading. Yes, Randy. That's, that's an interesting question because if you look, if you go to the Valley of Elah, now when, when they take you there, they take you to one end. And you can't really see because of development on how big that valley is. It's really pretty big. Uh, it, it's bigger than what... Um, if you notice the way it, it caused... Valley of Elah stretches almost from Gath up here. So now we're looking at almost 10 miles long, uh, that whole valley. Now, we do know that they were perched up here, but there had to be almost at least a mile separating the forces. But that's still pretty close for those big armies. Still pretty close. But what kind of weapons did they have? Um, even when we get into the, uh, the battle between David and Goliath, 
uh, Goliath had, would, would have to be very close to his opponent to be effective. David, on the other hand, could be quite a ways away. Uh, so uh, we can only guess, but I'm guessing if they're camped, if it says they were on the mountains on either side or those hills, um, I, I would say they were probably separated by at least a mile. But down in the valley, old Goliath could go down there and his voice would carry in between those hills and so he didn't need a PA system. So uh, maybe that... Uh, so, so they may or may not have been close enough to be trash talking what we would say that they were talking about... Yeah, I, th I think Goliath was doing all the trash talking for everybody. Uh, I, I think Israel was too scared to trash talk. Uh, they wanted to run. Okay, let's go back up now to 20. So David, and, and again, we go back to uh, Jesse has given David a mi mission to take bread and grain and uh, cheeses to um, the battle site. He rose early in the morning because he's got to travel 12 miles and 12 miles, he, and, and his daddy tells him, hurry, run. So uh, he's, he's got quite a journey to make. Um, he left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went, or walked, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. Um, let me pause here. Evidently, uh, every day they would kind of line up and kind of come towards one another and then they would stop and, and the battle never began, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David, uh, stop and think. Here's David. He's a young man, still a we think a teenager, and here's this big battle, supposedly. These armies facing each other. You, you can see the armies lined up on each side of the hill, and you can imagine his eyes, because all he's been looking at is sheep, and his eyes pretty big as he sees these armies. And I don't know, growing up, we grew up near a marine base, but we like to play army. I guess play marines when you're playing with marine kids, but uh, you know, we like to play army and uh, my mother wouldn't let us have little play guns, so we'd, we had pistols, you know. And, uh, and I think that's kind of been typical of uh, young men throughout the ages is this fascination with the military and you can imagine David, wow, I've never seen anything like this. Even though he's been in the royal court, he's never seen anything like this. So he left his, supply, his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted. Again, it's, it's uh, several other words in there, but it has shalom in it. He, uh, he wished them shalom. He asked them them shalom, uh, a peace, uh, his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, and there's that word for the man of the inner spaces. That's the second time it's used in scripture. That's the only two times that phrase occurs is here in 1 Samuel 17. The champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, one of his every 40 days, uh, uh, every day, morning and evening for 40 days, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. He keeps saying the same things. Send me a man to fight. You yellow-livered and all of that chickens, uh, come out and fight. Send somebody to fight me. What's the matter with you? So David heard them. So now David hears Goliath's challenge. 
and you can just imagine a man who believes in the Lord, and David did. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And to hear this heathen, this pagan, blaspheming his God, well, it kind of clicked something in him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So David hears, and he sees the impact that Goliath has on his people. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Um, so who, the king's already said, look, whoever kills this giant, whoever will go out and fight this giant, I'm going to make him a rich man. He's going to get my daughter. He's going to get a princess for a wife and give his father's house exemption from taxes. And if you notice that from taxes is in italics because we don't know exactly what it means. Most scholars now believe he's going to be exempt from taxes. He won't have to pay all the levies that the king puts on his people. And his and that father's house would not have to supply servants for the king. Uh, they would be exempted from uh, some of the mandatory services. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Oh, well, wait a second. Didn't we just read what's going to happen? So why is that there? Well, um, <laughs> some, some things about the text we can only imagine what it means. And, and most likely David only heard parts of it. And maybe he said, tell me again, uh, I didn't hear all of that. And we do that all the time. Uh, we, we don't hear everything it said and we have to ask for a clarification. And so uh, I think maybe that's the reason. But notice what David says, and takes away the reproach from Israel. Israel is looking bad, looking bad. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Wow. Seems like David's the only man in all of Israel that knows where the trust should be because the king doesn't have it and because the king doesn't have it the soldiers under him don't have it but David recognizes immediately hey this guy needs to be taken out uh, he is he is uh, he's not going to get away with this we are God's covenant people we we are we are the Lord's in control and the people then answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. So they just repeat what they've already said. Whoever kills Goliath, going to be a rich man, going to get to marry the princess, and his father's house going to be exempt from certain things from the king. Let's see if we can get one more. Now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? With whom have you left these few sheep in, those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Anybody have older brothers who used to torment you? <laughs> yeah, some of us uh, have, have known that. Well, Eliab was really upset with David. And, and it really, as, the, as the, this conversation progresses, it sounds like that this was kind of a common occurrence. David is the youngest. 
Now, I remember in my household, my youngest brother was 10 years older than, younger than me, and 15 years younger than my oldest brother. It was like, we didn't really know this kid, but we knew one thing. He got treated better than we did. <laughs> he didn't get as many whippings as I did. Uh, so there was this uh, separation between us. Well, I think this is illustrated here with Eliab's treatment with, with David. He is very upset. You know, you had this responsibility of washing the sheep. Now, what are you doing here? Well, remember, David left all the food back with the keeper. Eliab evidently doesn't know that David brought food for him and news from his father. He just thinks he's wandered up from Bethlehem to see a battle. And uh, that's where we're going to leave it tonight. Um, at the end of whatever verse that is, 28. Uh, and we'll pick up next week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your participation.